to uh, convene the uh, Ways and Means uh, Committee. We do have a uh, quorum present. Uh, Representative Huntley, you were here very early. Have you read the uh, minutes? And yes, like uh, Mr. Chair, I would move the minutes. Okay, Representative Huntley uh, moves the uh, minutes for uh, April 7, 2014. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. Uh, our first order of business is uh, the uh, budget resolution. So uh, the chair moves uh, that we bring uh, the uh, budget resolution, uh, the uh, CSRES 06 2, as adopted on March 31st, uh, 2014, before the committee. And um, I um, move the uh, a7 amendment, um, and uh, it involves uh, two uh, changes. Um, it's bringing down the other bill's uh, number by 1,215,000 and the HHS number by 3,599,000, and uh, then adjusting the uh, bottom line. And I'll ask Mr. Marks to uh, add to uh, the explanation of that uh, A7 uh, amendment to the budget resolution. Mr. Chair, members, if you look at the spreadsheet that's in your folder and look at the last column, it shows the, the differences in this resolution from the, from the March 31st uh, previously adopted one. And as you mentioned, the Health and Human Services number is lower. That, that just fits with the, uh, the, the cost of the bill given the floor amendments on Thursday. And then, uh, yes, it's, it lowers the total number, which has the effect of lowering the amount for other bills by the million two hundred and fifteen thousand. Uh, that would uh, that number would reflect the bills that have been passed out of this committee and includes a uh, bill on this morning's agenda with a three thousand dollar appropriation in it. Yet, yeah, but uh, that those would be the totals in there. So, uh, any uh, discussion on the motion? Uh, Representative Holbert. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Marks, could you just provide at some point a list to the committee of, oh, great, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Any other discussion? Uh, well, seeing on uh, the uh, Chair renews his motion uh, that um, we adapt uh, the uh, amendment. Any uh, further discussion? All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. Um, we uh, have uh, the next bill up, uh, House File 2852, the Game and Fish Bill by Representative Dill. And welcome to the committee. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, we are going to have an amendment. Do you want to uh, explain the bill and then take uh, the amendment, or um, um, you want to? Has the bill been moved, Mr. Chairman? No. Um, chair moves uh, House File uh, 2852. Uh, the uh, third engrossment be recommended to be placed on the general register. Uh, Representative Dill. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to move the A21 amendment because that gets the bill. Um, closer to the way it um, needs to be for final passage on the floor. And this is a technical amendment. It looks like a lot of language. It's technical amendments to uh, streamline the disability driver's license portion, um, which the DNR has concurred in. Uh, uh, Department of Public Safety, DNR, and myself have concurred on so I OK, so the uh, chair moves the A21 uh, uh, amendment. And uh, any uh, discussion? Seeing none, then all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. Now, there's one by Representative Huntley. Do you want to take that now or later? Uh, okay. Representative Huntley. Uh, Mr. Chair, I would move the uh, A23 amendment. Okay, and Representative Huntley, uh, the amendment does? Uh, well, this uh, uh, relates to luring and feeding owls, and uh, it puts a penalty in there uh, that is a petty misdemeanor. This has been approved uh, uh, by the uh, DNR, and uh, but it also added some language uh, that some science scientists and some professional wildlife photographers 
uh, would have been excluded from uh, taking their pictures. <laughs> uh, and this uh, uh, says that uh, that part of it is okay, so the uh, photographers are happy with this. Okay, and uh, Representative Dill? Yes, and I have uh, reviewed the amendment as well, and I'm, this is an issue. It particularly pertains to uh, snowy owls, which congregate uh, in a certain part of the state on their migration north, and they're, you know, wonderful to um, photograph, and people lure them in, and they don't do the right thing every time. So, yes, I'm in concurrence on the amendment into the bill. Any discussion on the amendment? Uh, Representative McNamara. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, this may be a question for DNR. Um, you may intentionally lure wild animals with food or an object, um, but may not be identifying which wild animal you're luring. We allow people to lure wild animals with food in certain instances. How will we decide that this is a snowy owl and not a uh, chickadee or a cardinal or rough grouse? I mean, if you attract the chickadee, you're going to attract the snowy owl, or if you're attracting rodents, you're going to attract the snowy owl. Um, I would think that this is going to give, uh, this is a policy I'm trying to understand. Representative Dill, i got to be honest, I did not know this was coming. I didn't see it until just now, or Representative Huntley. I'm trying to understand where we're coming from with this policy. This is clearly, a, Mr. Chair, I'm also surprised we're doing it here. It might be better. At least we can get DNR to testify. But this is not consistent with what we do in this committee. Uh, Representative Dill, do you want to um, respond or have DNR respond? Well, the DNR could come up. Uh, I mean, this Representative Huntley's, uh, the, you know, obviously the purpose is, is you can lure. <laughs> there's a million ways to lure them in. This is, talks about purposely, uh, means purposely attract a wild owl in an attempt to cause it to move from one location to the other. Now, I mean, that could be done with a mouse, for that matter. Um, Mr. Meyer is here. Okay, Mr. Myers, if you can identify yourself for the record. Did you hear the question? Mr. Chairman, yes. Members, for the record, Bob Meyer, Department of Natural Resources. I believe this issue has been brought to Representative Huntley by constituent concerns of his. What people were doing is, is placing um, rodents, mice, in a small aquarium and then these, these these snowy owls would come in and thinking that the, the mouse was there to eat and these photographers would be there all perched around taking pictures of the owl coming in and uh, so that's where the language comes from we have uh, Rodman Smith here from the enforcement division that can talk about any any legal issues that may arise I think the language is, is f pretty clear feeling that they intentionally lure or feed an owl in the wild of any animate or inanimate object, food, or animal. So uh, that's a specific issue they're trying to address with this language. Representative yeah, McMurray. Th thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, Mr. Meyer, um, wouldn't we have, um, truthfully, if nothing was being endangered, unfortunately, in some of these situations you just described, it might be near a road, uh, which would be real problematic for snowy owls near a lot of traffic or something. Wouldn't there be current law? <laughs> endangering um, that situation. Then the other problem I have is I don't think you can say intentionally just snowy owl. You could be putting a rodent there to uh, lure in a coyote, which you can shoot year-round. Um, uh, th I, I, I understand where Representative Huntley's coming from, and actually I would hope that they would have been currently breaking a law endangering uh, a wild animal because that's a protected wild animal in this state so it has some additional current law situations did did the COs under that situation the specific one representative Huntley's constituent asking about where there's no way you could use current law to uh, discourage them from doing that and do, does the department have a solution that they this this solution doesn't look like it works to me I, I don't think it gives you anything because you, the rodent could have been, how would you stop them if they said they were attracting a coyote? Mr. Chairman, uh, I'd like to bring down Major Rodman Smith to answer some of those questions. I if see I he was starting to move forward, so. <clears throat> and, uh, Mr. Chair, 
Mr. Smith, if you could identify yourself for the record. For the record, Rodman Smith, Assistant Director for DNR Enforcement. Mr. Chair, Representative McNamara. Um, so this has been a fairly recent issue up in the uh, northeast part of the state where there's been a number of photographers that are trying to lure these snowy owls, great gray owls, and they're moving into the state um, looking for food. And this activity is taking place near roads where they're putting out these um, mice, either in an aquarium or other ways to uh, take pictures. It is a traffic hazard. Uh, so it's not only a hazard for the animals that are coming in thinking they're going to get a snack, and it's a mouse in a, an aquarium, and then they have to fly off, you know, av avoid the landing or whatever they're going to do. And, and we have had a few get hit by cars or come very close. We've also had some issues with where these folks park on the road. Um, there is nothing currently in current law. We have been talking with some of those folks, and like most user groups, uh, most of them do understand the uh, potential danger they're putting not only the animals in, but also the snowy, uh, also the uh, motoring public. But um, there really isn't anything we can do currently other than to educate them. And we still, of course, have a group that continue to do this. So um, we look through this language, and um, you know, it is it is fairly narrow to owls. It doesn't go into different species of owls. Um, I think what we'll have to do is, you know, like any case that a law enforcement officer makes, they're going to have to sit back and look and see if if they're doing it during the daytime and they have the mice and they're waiting for the owls and they're taking pictures of owls. You know, we have the authority now to go in there and tell them what they're doing is illegal. Um, we did look at the coyote situation, but it's going to be fairly tough to say that a mouse in an aquarium is is uh, trying to lure a coyote because uh, it's not a traditional hunting method of trying to get a coyote. So we're comfortable with the language. Um, it gives us the ability to tell people not only what they're doing isn't safe for the owls, but you know it is a petty misdemeanor and they could get cited for it. Mr. McNamara, Representative McNamara. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, well, Colonel Smith, I'm trying to figure out um, this doesn't say, you know, in an aquarium or in an enclosed spot. Um, uh, I, I appreciate what Representative Huntley's doing, and I'd like to find a solution. I think it's a good idea. I, I heard of those problems, and my guess is either we had some accidents with vehicles or, unfortunately, also maybe a snowy owl lost its life swooping down in an unsafe situation. So I'm not sure. I, I guess I'll stay out of it at this point, but I'm concerned that this doesn't really – necessarily narrow it down to what you're trying to do. So I hope you'll work with Representative Huntley if you think it can be tweaked some when it gets to the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chair. No, that's, uh, you know, my thought, I, when you mentioned uh, it, that they're doing it along roadways and these, this is an endangered uh, species, if I recall your earlier comment, uh, the white owl or the snow owl. Um, I think uh, maybe if if the amendment goes on, uh, maybe uh, Representative Dill, Representative Huntley can work on uh, something about uh, not putting these uh, aquariums or whatever the um, to attract the mice uh, close to or near roadways. Maybe we need to put something in there about uh, distances or something from the roadways. If Representative Huntley, do you have any thoughts on that? Uh, I'm, I'm certainly that they are endangered, uh, I think that creates a problem if, uh, as uh, Sergeant uh, Smith is saying, or Major Smith, that um, there are problems along roadways. Well, uh, Mr. Chair and uh, members, I'm certainly willing to uh, work on this, try to get the language a little clearer, but uh, we're just trying to protect those snowy owls from getting hit by cars trapped in, in various places. So we make sure we're, we're doing that maybe between now and the floor? And maybe DNR can um, get engaged in, in continuing to work on that. Um, Representative McMurray, you done? Yes. Representative uh, Dittmer? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. And that was basically what my uh, comments would be, is to just have wording in there that would eliminate having this type of activity next to a road. I know. Uh, my wife and I, we own property up in the northeast area, and, and uh, snowshoeing uh, in the wintertime, it's great to see these uh, 
uh, wild birds in in uh, in, the, in nature, and uh, many times uh, by the time you see them and try to get your camera out, you just don't you don't get a shot at them uh, with your camera. And but it, uh, uh, I think uh, having this type of activity in the woods, in the in nature, away from the roads, would be a good 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 policy. Representative Dell, you look like you're about to say something. I'm pondering. I'm <clears throat> just thinking. You know, this. You don't very often see me come here as the defenders of wildlife, uh, but uh, <laughs> uh, this does happen. And whether it's in a clear cut where there's nobody for five miles, or whether it's alongside of a road, this is something that probably shouldn't be done. And uh, so I mean, I, I I think it's purposely attract a wild owl in an attempt. I don't know. I, I'm just. Hopefully, we can improve this because there is a need to have some uh, form of control on this. Um, I would. I can think of other situations as well. Not regarding what were endangered species. The people uh, attracted them in to get um, photographs. But the problem with that is they could have been the eaten rather than the bait. So uh, anyway. So you're I'll, speaking I'll, to see to the, I'll see to it that Representative McAmeer, Representative Huntley, and the department get some work done on this before it actually uh, is taken up on the House floor and that there's a be an amendment filed in accordance with our rules to fix the, fix the problem. Yeah, and that was my uh, suggestion, uh, <clears throat> and I think everybody is agreeing that they'll huddle and see if they can work something out then prior to floor action. Any further discussion on the amendment? Seeing none, then all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? No. Motion carried. Um, we now have uh, the bill before us uh, as amended. Uh, Representative Dill. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And all of, first off, all of the funds that are in this bill that come or go in the bill have to do uh, nothing with the general fund, only with the game and fish fund. And uh, so in Section 12, you have an oversight committee. Uh, the committee requests reimbursement for mileages and things of that type uh, expenses that we pay normally for uh, volunteer committees and the estimated cost is 30000 DMNR says that it will exorb it as the uh, Citizens Committee expires in June of 15 and they can deal with that. Uh, Section 16 and 17 allows for refunds and license corrections. The department will absorb those co costs. Uh, that has to do with um, what you're going to hear. The bill had license fee corrections that resulted in a slight decrease in revenues from the Game and Fish Fund. We established licenses, yearly licenses, but neglected to uh, change the lifetime licenses to reflect those changes. And that is a part of this bill that does that. And so, uh, I mean, there are things like uh, for the spearing license, it's a $47,000 uh, cost. Uh, Lifetime spearing is um, in section 23 and 26 is another item. Youth bear hunting is another item in 27, 28, and then uh, uh, for various license fee of thousands, it's the nominal amount the department is willing to absorb that. Um, there are also uh, is a decrease in in uh, total revenue for the game and fish fund in 15 of 91,134,000 in 16 and 17 relative to all these changes. Um, there, there is a fair amount of language in the bill, particularly the part that we adopted uh, in the amendment that uh, clarifies and, rela that and relates to how the disabled driver's license will be administered and how it will appear on the back of the license. The DPS has said that there is uh, no cost because we adjusted the date on the, on the uh, reissuance of the license just for those who haven't been in a committee. If you turn your driver's license over, there are different things that are endorsed on the back uh, that uh, you can have that are approved. And this would approve for a 100% disabled veteran, him being able to go get a driver's license or get a hunting license that he's entitled to uh, free. Uh, what happens now is also it's on the back of your license. DPS is going to do that when they reprogram their system in a coming year, so it has an effective date after they reprogram their system. Uh, there's a, there's a, uh, they had a $109,000 note on this from DNR, but when we made some changes, including the changes that we made in this amendment, 
Uh, it, in their words, substantially decreased the fiscal note down to somewhere less than fifty thousand dollars, which they, uh, which they can absorb, which they have indicated they will absorb. So all, essentially, what happens is, is you'll walk in instead of walking in with this big file of papers, a disabled veteran, and showing them to your local licensed person at your local uh, gas station, who probably doesn't have a clue what you're showing them. They'll turn a driver's license and look at it, and it'll say 100% disabled, and then they put it on the screen, and it tells them what licenses they can get. So uh, the veterans are particularly appreciative of that. Um, there's in section 55. There's a $10,000 cost which the uh, DNR says they will absorb it to make the uh, Minnesota River Valley area, which is in Redwood and Renville counties, uh, update it. Uh, it's their 2015 work plan. And then there's also in, uh, money that is moving around, again, not in the general fund, for the trap shooting facility grants, which came from a 2009 uh, appropriation. And now we are spending, actually spending the money on the purposes that it was originally intended to, intended for, and that is to enhance uh, youth trap shooting opportunities and to assist a gun club in moving off of uh, some uh, land in Itasca County, a small uh, open to the public gun club. And this is all an attempt to make shooting facilities more uh, appropriate for the use that we're seeing now. Um, all of these items have been vetted in the in the, the in the in the policy committee, in the uh, Representative Boginius's finance committee, in government operations, and now here, and have been uh, essentially the most controversy we've had now is over uh, baiting the owl. <laughs> okay, there are uh, questions. Representative Narnas. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Representative Dill, you talked just a minute ago about uh, the disabled driver's license or indica indication on the driver's license. Yeah. I've heard from, from some veterans because they also can visit our state parks, apparently, but they have to bring along a certain piece of paper in order to verify that they are entitled to that. Is this something that that license would also show so they don't need to do that anymore, or has that hasn't changed any? Mr. Chairman, Representative Dornis, this particular bill with the provisions contained within does not change that. Okay. This is only relative to hunting and fishing licenses for the 100 percent disabled. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Representative Anzell. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Section 45 uh, requires invasive species training for minnow dealers. Uh, you and I have had conversation in the past regarding um, the period in the spring where minnow dealers are allowed to trap shiner minnows, specifically on Winnie. Does this provision in Section 45, could, that be, could this provision be used to provide some relief? Mm -hmm to those minnow dealers who want, I can't remember if it's a earlier week or a later week um, to uh, trap shiners so we can catch a, a walleye. Well, Mr. Chairman, Representative Anzels, I was going to ask, I answer the question, no. But now Mr. Meyer is here and we'll find out if no means really no. Mr. Chairman, members, yes, no means no. But <laughs> we are, just to Representative Van Zell's question, we are working with uh, the individuals up there, and it relates to zebra mussels and the water temperature when the minnows are spawning. We're also doing a statewide risk assessment on the, the trapping and movement of bait that will also address some issues that other members have. Uh, I know Representative Erickson has an issue with moving some some emerald shiners around by individuals, and there's some other local bait issues that we're trying to look at at a statewide level dealing with invasive species, and we hope to come back with some solutions that will address all of those next year. Thank you. Mr. Mansell. I'm good. Okay. Uh, seeing no further uh, discussion, uh, okay. the chair uh, renews his motion where House File 2852, the third engrossment as amended, be recommended to be placed on the general register. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. 
Thank you. I just happened to think of something uh, going back to that owl issue just to make a comment. Uh, uh, you know, we I commented about the owl being endangered and wanting to make sure we protect the owl, but I recall a number of years ago my wife was driving down on uh, 169, the Twin Cities, and hit a duck, and you wouldn't believe the damage to the uh, windshield. So I think there's some safety uh, issues that uh, we want to address with those roadways. I'm just saying that. Probably so uh, Representative Huntley and DNR are working on that. I think there has to be a a setback uh, for safety reasons if we're deliberately attracting them. Um, that would be the auto side of it uh, as well. Um, okay, with that, uh, Representative Lesh is not here, so we'll uh, take uh, the uh, Representative Mason's bill next. Mr. Chair, members. And uh, let's see, that's 2752. The chair moves uh, House File 2752. The first engrossment be recommended to be placed on the general register. Uh, Representative Mason. Thank you. Uh, this bill is made up of compromise uh, language between Minnesota's disability community and the Met Council regarding the accessibility of light rail vehicles. Uh, and this bill will uh, ensure that, uh, the, essentially what it does is ensure that the arrangement that is on the blue line will be on uh, the further purchases as well. Sec, uh, subdivision 1 instructs the Met Council to adopt LRT vehicle design standards. Subdivision 2 establishes what the standards must include. And it is, it, you probably have this before you, the two dedicated spaces for wheelchair users in each car and seating for a companion adjacent to the wheelchair spaces and other uh, specifications that meet or exceed the, the ADA. And uh, the Met Council estimated that the cost of this bill would be 288,000 in fiscal year 16 when the next round of vehicle procurements occur and the councils indicated that they can absorb the cost. So I will just ask to stand for questions. Okay, any uh, discussion? Representative Abler. Thanks, Mr. Chair. This is just all news to me. I just have a, just a couple of questions. And I, I think the standards make sense. Um, can you I know when they built the North Star that they made a lot of uh, increased cost to accommodate the, you know, the, the platform and the access for people with wheelchairs and all. Can you uh, tell me how those uh, heavy rail cars compared with these? And this seems like something they should have thought of before and would just be something they, they would do. But uh, can you just kind of realize that's a money committee, but then... I have, a, I have a money question next to Okay. So. Uh, and this bill just deals with light, uh, the light rail. <coughs> and uh, we do have some uh, Judd here who can testify. Can <laughs> okay. um, identify yourself for the record? Yep, Mr. Chair and members, my name is Judd Shetland. I'm the Government Affairs Director for the Met Council. Appreciate the opportunity to be here. And um, Representative Abler, I can't give you the specifics between the uh, heavy rail, commuter rail cars that, that we have for the North Star service. Uh, but the, um, those uh, cars are ADA compliant and they're much wider and bigger uh, vehicles than our light rail vehicles. And what we uh, have before you in House File 2752 really comes down to a, a situation of companion seating. And uh, what we had on our blue line, uh, which is the Hiawatha line, versus what we have on Central Corridor and hope to have on the uh, Southwest Corridor, uh, we went from a, a Bombardier who was a, um, uh, constructed our LRV vehicles for Hiawatha to Siemens who uh, we are procuring for Central Corridor and, um, and uh, Southwest and there was an issue with uh, what the companion seating looked like on the uh, Central Corridor uh, vehicles that we've taken order of and so we've been working with the uh, Minnesota State Council on Disability and the Transportation Accessibility Advisory Committee to uh, make changes to the um, to these 40 additional vehicles that this bill speaks to, in order to make sure that there is uh, more companion seating available, because um, 
uh, what we understood was different than what the uh, community understood. So we're trying to uh, do right by that and make these adjustments in order to make sure that um, the folks who ride those vehicles are, um, are as comfortable as possible and also have the ability to have a companion who rides along with them have seating uh, adjacent to them on those vehicles. Mr. Person Abel. Well, it seems like a commendable thing to do. Just a question about the money. And the testimony was that the Met Council could absorb this cost? Yes. If I have stuff that I want the Met Council to do, how much more can they absorb? Uh, since they're obviously so wealthy and rolling in the dough, that it's just like a quarter million is just pocket change. Is that what you're kind of telling us? Uh, Mr. <laughs> Chair, Representative Abler, I, I, I don't think this is chump change. However, this is a very large procurement. The procurement on these uh, 40 vehicles is somewhere around $130 million. And uh, we are working with Siemens. Uh, when we make these adjustments to so hopefully be able to draw that number down. Uh, but when we uh, take uh, or issue our options on those vehicles, we believe that we'll be able to get that number down. But as part of that overall procurement, we believe that for these specific vehicles that uh, we'll be able to make those adjustments. But uh, we do not take it lightly and understand that that is um, a lot of money in any context. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And, uh, and I appreciate that. Uh, so it just it sounds like the standard for the ADA for the uh, commuter rail was a higher standard than the light rail. Is that just the summary of all this? Um, Mr. Chair, Representative Abler, no. Actually, the, um, the ADA uh, compliance for these uh, new vehicles, uh, LRV vehicles, uh, is ADA compliant. However, the configuration uh, wasn't as, um, as convenient uh, as what the um, uh, disability community was looking for. And so uh, we're trying to... Um, be good partners and make sure that uh, they have the ability to um, uh, be comfortable on those trains yeah. and also have that companion seating with them. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Nice to see you again. <laughs> good to okay, see you. Any, uh, any further discussion? Well, seeing none, then uh, I will renew my motion that House File uh, 2752, the first engrossment, be recommended to be placed on the general register. Seeing no further discussion, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? No. Motion carried. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, we now uh, have um, the uh, bill, House File 2728, uh, Representative Simonson. I think I saw him. There, there he is. Uh, chair moves that House File 2728 be recommended to be placed on the general register. Want to give us a uh, recap of the uh, bill? Good morning, Mr. Chair, members. Thank you. Uh, this is basically a DVS agency bill that accomplishes three things, two of which have a, a, a fiscal impact, and I'll just kind of briefly describe those. The first one is dealing with motorized bicycle operator permits, uh, changing current law, which essentially uh, establishes a $6.75 fee uh, for the exam and then a one year permit. We're deleting that fee. We're also deleting the $3.75 fee for duplicate one-year permits for those uh, operator permits. And we're replacing it with a $9.75 fee for a permit obtained before age 21, and that would be valid through age 21. So we're not changing the current law, which uh, allows these folks to get operator permits at age 15. Uh, we're just establishing a fee schedule for them to uh, get a permit that would be valid through age 21. The second piece that has a fiscal impact, Mr. Chair, uh, deals with a commercial learner's permit. It adds a $2.50 fee to issue the permit in a tamper-proof federal regulation compliant form. Can you say that again faster? <laughs> I could try. Is that like the lids on aspirin bottles? Well, essentially, Mr. Chair, that's the fiscal impacts of the bill. Any uh, discussion, Mr. Representative? Thank you, Mr. Chair and Representative Simonson. I, uh, this is funny. This bill is here. We were just talking about this whole topic. My son is now in driver's ed. He was informed by his driver's ed teacher that he could get a permit for a moped at age 15. We're all going, what? <laughs> uh, do you have any? Is anybody here that can just tell me why that's a good idea? Why we should have a 15-year-old <laughs> driving in the metro on busy highways with a moped when they've? <laughs> <When> they, <laughs> uh, 
Well, I mean, is yeah, that the uh, driver that tells him not to do that? Uh, Mr. Chair, Representative Abler, it's it's funny you asked that because we were just talking about that yesterday as well. And if Representative Khan was here, I'm sure she could explain uh, the history behind the age 15. But I do know that they're not allowed on highways. Um, but beyond that, the history of it, I'm not sure. But we're not changing current law in that respect. Hey, Representative Detmer. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. So uh, let's say if a person uh, has got their driver's license or they've got a uh, license to operate a motorcycle, would they have to still go through this? Representative Simonson. It's a, it's a good question, Mr. Chair, and I think rather than try to answer it, I'll ask Ms. McCormick <laughs> to answer it with the correct answer. You're welcome, and if you could identify yourself for the record. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. For the record, Pat McCormick, the Director of Driver and Vehicle Services. And the motorized bicycle is a moped, and so that's different than a motorcycle. And um, it's uh, less speed. And also, um, I have not been with the department long enough to be, I mean, I've been with the department for uh, 13 years, but I have not been a part of any discussions as to why the age 15 was picked. That age has been in place for numbers of years. Um, but we also have uh, people that are nearing 16 that are starting to take driver's ed as well for driving a car. And so um, they could be in the theory part of the driver ed program before they get into the uh, driving part of the program. And so I think that it, uh, that's probably the history that's involving the motorized uh, bicycle. I can certainly get some history and, and provide you with that because I, we do have staff in our agency that have, are the woman that administers the exam section of DVS has been with the department much longer. And so I can, also, I can provide you with that, the committee with that history if you'd like. Uh, Mr. Chair, yeah. My question was, let's say if I'm, uh, I have a driver's license, I also got qualified qualified to operate a motorcycle. Would I have to go through this this fee just to drive a moped? Mr. Chair and Representative, I my um, my recollection is that you don't, but I would like to verify that and get back to you. Okay, thank you. Can we have Representative Beard? Mr. Chair, thank you. I don't want to comment on the fiscal implications, but just for the committee's uh, uh, enlightenment, uh, point number three of the bill, section number three on commercial drivers license federal conformity. Members, this is one of those sneaky little things where we get ourselves, or most importantly, we get our citizens in all kinds of trouble. Uh, we passed a provision a few years ago that it came up just as conforming with U.S. Code 49 point whatever. And the next summer I started getting phone calls from neighbors whose kids were getting pulled over by the commercial division state patrol for hauling lawn mowers on trailers. It turns out that TSA and Homeland Security insisted that we comply with federal commercial driving license statutes and then hauling more than six gallons of gasoline on a trailer with the intention of committing commerce, mind you, like mowing a yard, is now a federal violation. You have to be hazmat certified, commercially licensed, and you have to have a medical certificate. And these were 18-year-old kids working their way through college. This is what this section has done to us over the years. And I just want you to be aware that what we're doing, and this is no um, reflection on Representative Simonson, because I've carried these stupid things too, and then the next summer you end up getting bit. Or more importantly, your citizens end up getting bit in the butt by the patrol because they point out to you gleefully, you voted for that representative. <laughs> So I'm not sure what all is in here, but last summer, and this will be my last little story I'll tell you about what we're doing to the citizens, there was a gentleman who'd been an over-the-road trucker for like 100 years, and he knew the law inside and out. And he couldn't pass his commercial test anymore, so he sold his truck and he bought a Matco route. Now, you know what the Matco tool guy is? Little panel truck, he drives between Chaska and Shakopee. It's an eight-mile route. And one morning, the state patrol pulled him over, weighed his truck, gave him the 32-point safety check and asked to see his commercial driver's license. And he said, this is my truck. I run a route that's eight miles long. The truck is under 26,000 pounds. And they said, too bad. You're engaged in interstate commerce according to the Homeland Security's new statutes. Mm -hmm. Fortunately, the patrol had pity on him, and they let him drive his truck home and park it, where he took all his tools out, put them in his station wagon, and finished his route. <laughs> 
But he now, for some reason or another, because of one of these little conformance issues, qualifies as a commercial interstate operation and has to have a medical card, a logbook in his cab talking about when he got in the truck in the morning and when he left, and all that stuff, even though he drives a truck under 26,000 pounds. I don't know what's in this federal conformity. I'm probably going to vote for Representative Simonson's bill because it's necessary stuff. But I just want you to know that every time we pass these little tidbits, farmers that haul grain to an elevator on a river are now considered to be engaged in interstate commerce, and that's where this mischief comes from. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for letting me get that off my chest. Thank you. Uh, let's see, we have uh, Representative Arnest next. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and uh, Representative Simon Simonson. I am a big fan of the moped. Uh, I used to drive one, ride one. I went to work every day on that moped, drove about six miles down a county road. And we had a lot of fun doing that. I, I, I thought maybe the mopeds had become extinct, so I'm, I'm at least pleased to see that they haven't. Now, the question I have, there's a, also a small a scooter that's under 50 cc that doesn't require a license. Are these two things related? Is that still possible to buy with those small scooters? that are limited on speed, limited on horsepower, and as far as I know, no, no permit is needed whatsoever. Mr. Uh, Chair and Representative Nornis, I think that that's the case. I think it depends on the weight of the vehicle and um, what your and what the speeds. So that would be something I would need to verify. But as far as I know, I haven't <clears throat> seen any changes in those regulations. So I'll verify it for you, though, just to make sure. Okay. Mr. Chair, uh, just, uh, just uh, one further comment. The moped I had would go 25 miles an hour on a good, calm day. My scooter that I had, which was limited on horsepower, would go 55. Whatever. <laughs> we, uh, I see Rep. Thanks, and I'm glad you're still here, Rep. Nornis, with that high-speed uh, I wore a helmet. Scooter. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, I, I just can't not finish up my conversation here. We spent a weekend with my 15-year-old son telling us why he needed this moped, and his teacher had told him, he's surprised more kids didn't have mopeds, and we, uh, we, now we want to actually go complain to the school district about this teacher. <laughs> <laughs> and he says, well, our neighbor's going to get one. Um, the yeah. <laughs> like, well, there's one for $700. I really needed to get to football. Like, ah. Um, so, Ms. McCormick, is there, I mean, I don't hear a lot of reports about 15-year-olds getting crashed on mopeds, but it, is there data about, I mean, as it, it just seems intrinsically or whatever, as a parent, this is a bad idea to give a 15-year-old kid, especially in a busy metro town, one of these mopeds. But is there a data about crashes and how it's actually worked, which will... <laughs> on that Ms. point, uh, Rep. Sager? Well, after the answer, yes, to that point. Uh, Mr. Chair and Representative Abler, um, I can certainly get look at our crash facts. I don't have that with me, but we have uh, we do our annual report on crash facts and and check on what the moped crashes, what that level is at. We certainly have had an increase in the in the number of motorized bicycle um, permits that we have been giving out. Not a gigantic one. We had uh, 49 people apply in 2011, and uh, it's risen to 132 this past year. So it's still not a huge number of people that are getting moped permits. So. Representative Abler, when you were talking this weekend, it reminded me, my son is now in his 40s. When he was a teenager, he wanted one of those scooters, and he wasn't old enough. And virtually all the kids his age in the neighborhood had one, and I said, no, you have to wait until you're old enough. So one day he said, Dad, I know why I have to wait. It's because you're a state representative, and we're the only ones that have to follow the law. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, so when you're dealing with teenagers, that's the way they sometimes uh, perceive things. <laughs> but he did wait until he was old enough. For, uh, for other reasons than, than the mm. fact that his dad was a state representative. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Uh, oh, beard. Anybody else uh, have any comments? Uh, Representative Beard. Just a comment to Representative Abler's question. Uh, several years ago, in a spirit of bipartisan enthusiasm, I carried a bill with Senator Murphy and Representative Kahn about electric scooters. Remember those? Yeah. Everybody had to have an electric scooter, and 12-year-olds were going to be slaughtered 
in the wholesale numbers according to a Channel 9 news story they did. <laughs> And after three years, that reporter, I give him credit, he circled back around to do the follow-up, but then he dropped the story because guess how many people have been killed, maimed, and slaughtered on electric scooters after we passed the law? None. Just but go by the way. I thought you'd like to know that. <laughs> Mr. Chair. I think we can uh, move along at this yeah, point. Yeah. Well, just, uh, just to finish. Well, the reason this comes up is my wife said I had to repeal this law, so that's why <laughs> you will repeal that law. So there you go. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I've Okay, done my the part. Chair uh, removes, <laughs> renews his uh, motion that House File 2728 be recommended to be placed on the general register. Any additional uh, comments? Okay. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion no. carried. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Uh, Chair and members. We, we um, okay, we uh, have uh, Representative Simon is going to uh, take. Uh, the uh, bill, uh, House File 2925. Uh, so Representative Simon moves that House File 2925, first engrossment, be recommended to be placed on the general register. And uh, there is uh, an amendment, uh, Representative Simon, do you want to uh, take the amendment next or explain it over? I'll, I'll take the amendment if I could, just to get it in the shape that we need it. I'll move the A1 amendment, Mr. Okay, Chair. Okay, Representative Simon moves the A1 amendment. Okay, on the amendment. You wanted to explain the amendment? Oh, actually, um, you know, maybe what I ought to do, what I ought to do before then, since I'm just Representative Lesh's body double today, uh, I'm going to uh, just talk about the bill briefly, then maybe we can take up the amendment since I've already moved it. Uh, members, uh, again, I'm. Oh, we, on the amendment, oh, okay. uh, we, it's, it deals with the uh, cost in the future by any of the marks. Um, Mr. Chair, members, the A1 amendment, uh, uh, essentially uh, re um, clarifies uh, the Section 8 in the bill. Uh, it takes uh, out the language that would essentially uh, allow payment from any available uh, appropriation for this purpose and makes it clear that uh, the compensation panel needs to submit the rec or the Commissioner of MMB needs to submit the compensation panel's recommendations to the next session of the legislature. And then it appropriates 3000 for the operation cost of the compensation panel, which was the number shown in the fiscal note. So any discussion on the amendment? Mr. Chair? Um, I'm not opposed to this, but I do want to raise uh, for your, uh, raise to your attention, just so you can make a policy determination here. Uh, for more than a decade, the de minimis amount for a bill going through Ways and Means and not needing an appropriation was $2,000. Um, when I was at Ways and Means Chair, there was a con bill, I believe it was to increase the size of the pension bill. It came in at $3,000. I allowed for that to go through as a de minimis amount. Um, given that the standard for that had not been raised in a really, really, really long time. So um, I'm just curious if we go ahead and make an appropriation here, are we going back to a lower standard or? Um, Mr. Chair, Representative Holberg, the, I think there were further issues with this bill. And if you read the MMB part of the fiscal note that's in your folder, the suggestion was that the language that is in the bill before the amendment uh, may allow the commissioner of MMB to, to access existing appropriations, the, the general fund contingent appropriation that's included in the state government bill of 500000 and possibly the tort claims appropriation of 161000 for these purposes. So, so the, language is a, was a, the language in the bill before the amendment uh, is not real clear as to whether the issue was $3,000 or perhaps uh, $600,000 uh, as the cost of this bill. Well, M Mr. Chair, um, once the amendment mm. is put on, <coughs> if it's put on in its current form, you then have a cost of $3,000 to the bill. And so if we're going to revert back to doing appropriations at that level, then I'm just curious what your de definition of a de minimis, de minimis amount would be. Yeah, uh, I think, that's Holmberg, we still, uh, Holmberg, we still use uh, 3,000, but this one, as Mr. Marks explained, is before us. Um, 
because of the uh, history of the bill and uh, when the bill first came forward I indicated that the costs would be being addressed uh, after this panel was set up in the next biennium. So this one was rather unique the way it, uh, the way it came forward, but uh, now that it's here, um, from what we're free, I need to read the final <coughs> what I mean by de minimis. Well, um, Mr. Chair, if, if we don't need to do that, then we should probably delete lines 9 through 12 of the amendment. If you're going to stay with a standard of $3,000. I think we'll leave it in. Um, okay, any further discussion on the amendment? Uh, Representative Anderson. Not on the amendment, sorry. Sorry, I didn't hear. I, I'm sorry, Mr. Oh, Chair, no. I'll wait till the. Yeah. Okay. Any further discussion on the amendment? Seeing none, then all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, motion carried. Representative Simon on the bill. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, discussion. This has gone through a couple committees. Some members here have already been uh, introduced to it, and I know we're here to talk about the money mostly. But this uh, this bill, before I turn it over to the other testifiers, you know, provides compensation for exonerated persons. I have to say, it's pretty narrowly tailored, based on what other states have done. It would set up basically a Supreme Court panel to determine the amount of compensation. It sets a floor, but not a ceiling for that compensation. Um, it is also only available in pretty narrow circumstances. So, for example, it requires exoneration, which is different from just simply saying that someone is not guilty of something. It means they still probably, or I shouldn't say probably, possibly could have uh, committed the crime. It, it, it just means that put to their proof, um, the prosecution didn't prove it. That's different from total exoneration. This bill only applies in cases of exoneration and only applies in cases where they're not also s serving concurrently prison time for some other offense. So let's say someone's in prison and they're, ex and they're in prison for two reasons, for two separate crimes. Um, and they're exonerated for one but not the other. They're not eligible. They're not eligible, assuming that the, the prison time is the same there. So this is really a narrow circumstance of someone who's truly exonerated and innocent and has had years of their lives taken away from them. Um, that's the basics of the bill. Other states do this. This is modeled as I understand it or as I remember it. Uh, on what other states do, quite narrowly tailored for those really exceptional circumstances. And we heard compelling testimony in other committees for people who literally did not do something, where there is an exoneration, an admission by the prosecution and by the state that they made a mistake. Um, very rare situation. Uh, but for more information, uh, I'll just turn it over to Ms. Emerson to Ms. Emerson. describe it more fully. Uh, Mr. Chair, members, my name is Elizabeth Emerson. I'm with the firm of Goff Public, representing the Innocence Project of Minnesota today. Um, as Representative Simon uh, mentioned, this is a narrowly tailored bill to address circumstances where individuals may have served time in prison, then new evidence is brought forward during the time that they are serving in prison that uh, displays to the court that they are actually innocent of the crime for which they are serving time. Um, the narrowing kind of the discussion to the fiscal note um, as was discussed with the amendment, there was an initial cost put forward by MMB projecting the service. There are currently two individuals in Minnesota prison that were serving time in Minnesota prison that we know would be eligible for this compensation. The fiscal note outlines um, potential costs, but the panel would obviously come back and determine the specific costs associated with these individuals' time in prison. Um, but the fiscal note is perspective looking at that. Um, and I would stand for further questions. Okay, uh, Representative Anderson, you indicated you had a question. Sure, thank you, Mr. Chair and Representative Simon. So in essence, what we're doing is we're setting aside a certain pot of money to compensate these individuals, right? Mr. Representative Chair. Simon. Yes, that's correct. Okay, sounds fam uh, familiar to uh, an amendment I had yesterday. So thank you, Mr. Chair. <laughs> Representative Abel. Mr. Actually, I think uh, this, that's not quite true. I think it sets aside a process by which then the legislature could appropriate money, like in the claims bill. Because it's, it would maybe even be in the claims bill or something. Is that, would that, that be the action step of this? My take on it would be very similar to the claims bill. That's yeah. correct. Yeah. A good bill. We, we would still have to take action yeah. as a body. Uh, any further discussion? Well, seeing none, then uh, Representative Simon uh, renews his motion that House File 2925, the first engrossment as amended, be recommended to be placed on the General Register. 
See no further discussion. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. Okay. No announcements. Uh, doesn't look like uh, we're planning uh, to meet uh, again this week unless something I'm unaware of uh, develops and it's not much time left in the week. So with that, um, thank you and uh, thank everybody for starting a little earlier than we normally do, but session starts again. That meeting adjourned. Morning.